everybody, welcome back to Off The Grid Tiny House. We're on day four of our 50 day challenge. If you wanna learn more about that, check out our intro video. In our last episode, we installed the subfloor framing of the tiny house. And on this episode, we're gonna be installing the subfloor plumbing. Subfloor plumbing is responsible for supplying fresh water and removing all the wastewater of the tiny house. A lot of people are really intimidated by plumbing and electrical work. So I'm gonna take some time to break it down and simplify it for you. We'll start by talking about the water supply system because it's a lot simpler. Water will enter the tiny house under the floor here and will branch off to hit all of our plumbing fixtures on its way to the water heater. We'll refer to the main line that runs from the inlet to the water heater as the trunk and refer to the lines that run to the individual plumbing fixtures as branches. It's common to use three quarter inch pecs for the trunk and half inch pecs on the branches but some plumbers use three quarter inch for tubs as well, so they can be filled up faster. PEC stands for cross-linked polyethylene and is a very popular choice of material for water supply plumbing because it's easy to install, safe for drinking, and relatively durable. If you look at the floor plan of the tiny house, you can easily spot all of the plumbing fixtures. We'll need water for the refrigerator, the kitchen sink, the toilet, the shower, the laundry, and the bathroom sink. Plumbers refer to the bathroom sink as lavatories. If you look back at our model, you can see that the branches all make their way from the trunk to those same fixtures. In episode seven, we'll start to build the walls of the house and you can see here how the water supply lines will go up through the subfloor, inside the walls of the house, and then to the individual plumbing fixtures. While water supply lines are pressurized, wastewater lines run by gravity, so they must always be sloped down towards the outlet. Again, looking at the floor plan, we will need wastewater lines for the kitchen sink, the toilet, the shower, the lavatory, and the laundry. Each of these plumbing fixtures requires a trap and a vent. A trap is a section of the wastewater pipe that traps water. This water blocks up the pipe so that nasty smells don't make their way from the sewer or septic system into your tiny house. A vent is a section of the wastewater pipe that provides outside air to ventilate the pipe. Without these vents, Wastewater won't move very well inside the pipes. Have you ever put your finger over the end of a straw with water inside? Remember how the water magically stays inside the straw even with gravity pulling on it? A plumbing system without vents is like the straw with a finger on it. Adding vents is like taking your finger off the end of the straw. So let's go through each of the fixtures and spot the traps and vents. Here we have the laundry trap and vent. Next, we have the lavatory. You may have seen a lavatory trap before as it's common to put them underneath the sink in the cabinet. So that will be installed when we install the sink cabinet. The lavatory vent is here. The shower trap is here and the vent is here just before the trap. Toilet traps are built into the toilet so we don't have to worry about it. The toilet vent is here. The kitchen sink trap is under the kitchen sink just like the lavatory trap. So it's also not shown here. There wasn't a good place for me to put a kitchen sink vent because all the interior walls are on the other side of the tiny house. So instead, I used a larger pipe size than necessary. This is called a combination waste and vent system. So what is the necessary pipe size? Toilets require a three inch pipe and a two inch vent. The laundry and shower require a two inch trap and a one and a half inch vent. Both sinks require only a one and a half inch trap and vent. The only other thing you need to keep in mind is that whenever you have a vertical line turning into a horizontal line, you need to use a nice long bend. If you're turning from a horizontal line to a vertical line, you can use a short bend. This makes a lot of sense if you think about it because you don't want things to pile up at the bottom of a vertical to horizontal change. You want a nice long turn for it to flow and not pile up. Keeping all these little rules in mind, you can design a nice plumbing system for your tiny house. If you're interested in asking more detailed questions about plumbing, I'm happy to field any questions from our Patreon sponsors. Just sign up here. Let's take a quick overview of what we hope to accomplish today. We will first install the wastewater pipes and fittings. We'll be using ABS pipe for the wastewater lines. ABS stands for acrylonitrile butadiene styrene. With a name like that, you might guess that you shouldn't use ABS for water supply and you would be correct. However, we won't be drinking anything from the wastewater system and ABS is a very common material to use for wastewater lines since it's relatively inexpensive and easy to install. 
We will ensure proper slope throughout the system as we install the pipes and fittings according to the design we just showed. We will also ensure the pipes are properly supported by wood and metal straps called plumber's tape. Next, we will install our PEX trunk line that runs from the inlet to the water heater and T's that will branch off to the individual fixtures. The PEX will also need to be supported by plastic hooks that attach to the floor joists. The manufacturer of the PEX also manufactures these hooks for this very purpose. The first step to installing the waste pipe is called laying out. I had designed the pipes to come out in precise locations. As you saw earlier in the episode, vent pipes are designed to run inside walls so they aren't visible, and stub outs also need to be positioned precisely. A stub out is the part of the pipe that protrudes out of the wall or floor of the tiny house. For example, toilet stub outs are always installed coming out of the floor 12 inches away from the finished wall behind it. We will discuss this in greater detail in a later episode. For now, you can see that I marked out lines corresponding to the precise locations for each fixture vent and stub out, put some screws in where my lines were, and ran a string between the screws to mark the location where that stub out needs to be. In some stub out locations, I had to use some scrap wood to raise the string up to make room for the fitting. I started the ABS installation at the entrance to the opening in the floor framing that we created in the last episode. The building code has limitations to the size of holes you can make in floor joists. This is important because any hole you put in a floor joist will weaken it slightly, and the bigger the hole, the weaker the joist gets. Building codes require any holes drilled in joists to allow for 2 inches on either side of it. Since the width of our 2 by 8 floor joist is 7.5 inches, if you subtract 2 inches from either side, that means the biggest hole we can make is 3.5 inches. Our ABS main waistline is three and a half inches in diameter, so we need to drill our hole right in the middle of the joist and slope the line from there. I made the hole and installed a fitting in the hole just as I designed. A fitting is a section of pipe that causes it to turn or divert from one into two other pipes. This fitting doesn't need any plumber's tape because it's supported by the wood around the hole. Using some ABS cement, I glued a small section of 3 inch ABS to this fitting and glued the next fitting to the other end. ABS cement is very easy to use. Simply apply a nice even coat to the outside of the pipe and another nice even coat to the inside of the fitting and push the pipe inside the fitting. Easy. The cement hardens within a minute so it's very important to ensure the fittings are lined up correctly. I used a plumber's level to ensure the pipe running between the fittings was at the proper slope. The plumber's level is very easy to use and will clearly tell you when the pipe is at the proper slope of one quarter inch per foot. I nailed a small 2x4 between the joists so that the pipe was supported at this slope by the 2x4. Small pieces of wood like this used as support are called blocking. Hey guys, I spend my time and money making these videos for you because I want to give you the confidence and knowledge for you to build your own tiny house. In return, I'd really appreciate it if you could pause this video, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and visit our Patreon page. Your support ensures that you'll see more awesome videos like this one. If you do start building your own tiny house, you can use the links in the description below to purchase your tools and supplies, and that also helps out the channel. I repeated the process of gluing pipe and fittings and attaching them to wood blocking so that each stub out and vent were perfectly lined up with my string and each pipe and fitting were supported by wood and plumber's tape. For the kitchen sink line, you can see how I had to notch the top of the joist to make room for the pipe. Joist notching is also limited by building codes to one sixth the depth of the joist. So in this case, that's one and a quarter inches. This part of the waste pipe will eventually end up in the empty space between the bottom of the kitchen cabinets and the floor. The last step was to install the PEX for the water supply lines. The placement of the water supply lines doesn't have to be quite as precise as the waste lines because they're smaller, but you still need to ensure that they come out of the subfloor inside the walls so they aren't visible. Just like with the ABS, I use screws and string to lay out the locations where the PEX will penetrate the subfloor. The PEX fittings are attached with a tool called a PEX expander and expansion rings. You use the expander to expand the expansion ring so it can fit around the PEX tubing the ring will naturally go back to its original size. Then you use the expander on both the tubing and the ring so they can fit around the fitting. 
Again, in just a minute, the PEX is returned to its original size, so it forms a very tight seal on the fitting. It's that easy to install. No messy glues or cements, screwdrivers, or pliers. As a side note, there are several different types of PEX, and I'm using expansion PEX, also called PEX Type A. There's a more common type of PEX that you'll find at Home Depot that's called PEX Type C. The expansion PEX rings I'm using are more reliable than the crimp style rings that are used with PEX Type C. However, PEX Type C is more common and easy to find. I nailed PEX support hooks to the joist to keep the PEX supported, and I used PEX bend supports anytime the PEX makes a tight turn to keep it from kinking. Last, I wrapped the PEX lines in pipe insulation and taped the seams between the pieces of insulation to ensure the pipes don't create condensation on the insulation. Anytime you have a cold material touching a warm material, there's an opportunity for condensation to occur, and in this case, the pipe insulation and tape will block any condensation that forms from contacting the insulation. Every episode, I want to take just a minute and talk to you about the setbacks and struggles I faced along the way. You know, if you're going to be building your own tiny house, you're going to be facing your own setbacks and struggles. And I want you to be prepared to deal with them and not beat yourself up. Just take care of it, move on, and uh, be happy about your skill as a builder. Even myself, been building houses, I, I make mistakes. Um, every single build I've done, I think I've missed some plumbing parts. There's just so many fittings. Uh, they're all different, and a lot of times I'll plan out and I'll realize, oh, I'm missing this one. So this one was no different. I'm missing a part. I had to go to the store, grab it, and uh, actually I had to wait till the next day to finish things up. So that cost us a day, or at least half a day, and um, it was frustrating. But, you know, you take care of it and move on. In our next episode, we'll be installing the subfloor insulation of the tiny house. The insulation will not only keep the floor nice and warm, but will also prevent condensation issues inside the subfloor framing. Installing blown cellulose is actually pretty fun, so I hope you can all join me in the next episode as I install the subfloor insulation. Mm -hmm.